Uh, as I mentioned before, we're talking <laughs> I, I never think to remember to wait for that. Uh, <laughs> so as I mentioned before, uh, we are speaking about dual diagnosis and understanding co-occurring disorders uh, within addiction. Um, oh, yes, oh, I got to agree first. Okay, got it. <laughs> uh, so we're fighting a battle on two fronts. Um, and, that's, and that's something that sometimes is forgotten uh, when we talk about addiction, when you look at it in a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, recovery group basis. Um, very often, uh, many of us in recovery can get very, very uh, uh, hung up on tunnel vision about specific problems in addiction, whether that be alcoholism or addiction to methamphetamines or opiates. And when we only address a certain problem in the uh, individual's life that's suffering from addiction, we may not get the results either one of us wants, those that are treating the individual and the person coming for treatment. And the reason that is on a lot of uh, uh, occasions is because there's something else going on. There's an underlying reason to the why. And that's what we uh, I want to address today. So when we talk about fighting a battle on two fronts, um, as if suffering from addiction wasn't enough, uh, many of us do suffer from what is called dual diagnosis of co-occurring disorder. Uh, in this presentation, we'll explore some of the common disorders uh, with those addictions suffered from, along with practical methods to address them using rational deduction, CBT, and smart tools, which is the real difference of what we're talking about today. It's very specific on how we handle it here uh, in smart recovery. So a little background on dual diagnosis, even though I'm preaching to the choir, but I emerged a little bit over 20 years ago, but still is really in its infancy uh, regarding proper treatment and identifying symptoms since there's so many different uh, modalities on how to address these problems. Um, Dual diagnosis describes a practice that treats people who suffer from both an addiction and a psychiatric disorder. But we're also finding out now that there's a lot more than just the psychological problems that go along with that, including trauma and uh, life experiences uh, given to them by culture and society. For example, you could be addicted to drugs, alcohol, gambling, sex, or a combination of things. And you can have a psychiatric disorder that includes schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, eating disorders, depression, borderline personality disorder, panic disorder, and many others. A uh, high-functioning alcoholic, for instance, can suffer from a mood disorder. A person addicted from crack can suffer from a clinical depression. Someone suffering from bulimia can also be diagnosed with bipolar disorder. So only identifying one problem may not always be enough with every single client. And doing a little bit more deep diving into the commonalities of where these addictions originated from uh, tends to be a much more progressive practice that we're seeing, especially in the peer-to-peer group settings uh, that we normally run in smart recovery. So the focus, uh, as you see from the previous slide, there are numerous types of disorders that can coincide with drug, alcohol, or maladaptive behavior addiction. For many of these psychiatric issues, such as paranoia, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, the most prudent con course of action, excuse me, would be seek medical professional um, for treatment options as soon as possible. Uh, that does not mean there are not tools and skills you can put to practice during your everyday life to help manage, minimize, and control these disorders. Uh, the following are some of the common co-occurring disorders many are suffering from uh, addiction face, but not as widely discussed as compared to psychiatric disorders accompanying addiction. We will follow the set uh, with some of these techniques uh, used to combat them with the, uh, within the SMART Recovery Program. So the first one I wanna talk about is insomnia. Um, insomnia, this is definitely one that um, I, see in um, the different types of groups that I participate in virtually all around the country that really transcends a lot of different uh, cultural boundaries, ethnicities, and um, different types of substance use disorders. Insomnia is a, a very, very common side effect uh, that we all know very well, but how we deal with that in relevance to why someone is using um, a, a legal or even legal substance in, into abuse is uh, specific to the individual. And sometimes understanding that uh, can be very beneficial. Uh, those in early recovery know that problems of this co-occurring disorder all too well. Many have even turned up, uh, turned to their DOC to help them sleep. The problem is drugs and alcohol don't put our minds into a REM state. We lose consciousness, but our bodies and minds never truly shut down. I, for one who suffered from an addiction uh, disorder to alcohol, uh, to alcohol, understand this too well. Uh, the horrible cycle of I can't sleep because I'm hungover and I, I haven't had my substance, you know, my drug of choice. So I'm going to indulge more of it 
to help me pass out because I want to go to sleep. But in truth, I'm not getting any rest. And that was a cycle that I lived for a long time when I was in the entertainment and restaurant business. So it's a very, very common problem. Uh, according to the Sleep Foundation, drinking alcohol before bed can add to the suppression of REM sleep during the first two sleep cycles. The result is spending 10 hours in bed, but feeling like you haven't slept a wink. Uh, look at some of the effect. Uh, let's look at some of the effective methods to restore normal sleep patterns. I know when I first got into recovery, um, many of the questions I had started with why and then what could I do? Uh, a lot of the peer-to-peer -peer aspects of the process didn't have the exact answers with dealing with these other problems, such as insomnia, which was extremely problematic to my lifestyle balance. So, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about it today, because I'm sure most, many of you have even experienced yourself, your clients asking questions regarding the problems that are occurring in their lives due to the, to the substance use disorder, or perhaps occurring that hadn't happened to them before, and they're not sure as to why. A lot of times it is relating to the uh, SUD or MHD that, that is occurring um, alongside these disorders. So something that we can do to, to help out these individuals, and this is things that I've gone over in my peer-to-peer -peer meetings that help the layman understand some of the aspects of what to do to combat their uh, problems of insomnia. So reducing stimuli before bed, right? And what does that specifically look like? So I run this scenario all the time in my groups. I ask people, do your nights look like this? Uh, after dinner, you sit on the couch and watch Netflix while semi-mindlessly scrolling through social media. You pick up your phone and do some last minute checks, right? The bright lights you, uh, the bright lights on your screen block the release of the sleep hormone melatonin. That's the first problem, right? Additionally, all that scrolling and responding is overstimulating your brain during a time of day when you should be doing the opposite. Even if you have good intentions, when you set your phone beside your bed, every buzz, ding, and ping is like squirting ice water on your meant to be sleeping brain. Never mind the fact that sober scrolling can be anxiety producing. Seeing pictures of friends partying or strolling down uh, the uglier side part of memory lane can keep you up at night even more, right? And we, I'm pretty sure I don't have to preach to the choir about the dangers of social media when you're in recovery, right? And while doing that in bed prior to relaxing, it could be even more dangerous, right? Because you're only there by yourself, usually in an isolated state, either your partner's asleep or you're there alone and you have nothing but your racing thoughts to fall back on. So very dangerous behavior for someone in, especially in early sobriety or recovery. All right, so we learned to shut the system down, right? Count it down. So bedtime is just that, right? It's time for bed. Eliminate anything in your bedroom that has nothing to do with sleep. Invest in items and practices that will help maintain your sleep without disruption. Noise machines, right? Blackout curtains, for instance, right? Purchase a set of blackout curtains, utilizing a noise machine to increase the background noise. Like me, I was in the military, so I'm up every single thing. I mean, a, a mosquito can sneeze and I wake up in the middle of the night, right? So it's important for me to have that steady drone so I maintain my sleep balance better. Keeping uh, eating healthy habits, uh, keeping healthy eating habits, right? Uh, and avoiding heavily seasoned or spiced foods uh, before bedtime um, and your last meal before you go to bed, right? They, they have shown that heavy spices have been shown to disrupt sleep, right? So maybe lay off the pepperoni pizza before hitting the sack, right? Invest in a comfortable pillows, bedding and decent mattresses. You're worth it. I cannot stress enough how this is overlooked sometimes that we don't, so many people that participate in recovery talk about how Spartan they're living because they're just concentrating on scaling back and not understanding that sometimes your self-care is the prominent factor that needs to be kicked, to looked after to increase your progressiveness in recovery from any one of these symptoms, right? Your sleep is crucial. It's crucial to your sobriety, it really is. In self-care and do-it-yourself techniques are, are ineffective. Um, consult your, if these are ineffective, consult your doctor. To find out other methods that may help you achieve restful, consistent sleep. And for others that are already in the medical profession, obviously keeping that network open of communication for those that may not understand one field to another, right? Having ourselves, having these conversations with our peer supporters that may be involved in your organizations or your licensed uh, social workers or counselors, right? That may not be as well versed in the medical um, side of the aspect, making sure that we have this information readily available to everyone who is involved in the recovery community. So another one, as I just hinted about, was poor eating habits, right? Many people who begin to manage their addictions 
fall into sub, um, substitutional bad habits to compensate for the loss of their drug of choice or DLC. For many, this falls into unhealthy patterns of eating, drinking, uh, and drinking non-alcoholic beverages. For instance, someone who gives up alcohol may use sugar as a substitute to offset the new waves of emotions that individual is now facing without their drug of choice. Unfortunately, left unchecked, this new habit can spiral into yet another unhealthy behavior that can jeopardize their health in many ways. So one of the most effective ways that I've seen is creating a change of plan, putting something to paper and being very specific, right? In smart recovery, we actually utilize the CBT SMART model. And I mean that as the acronym, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time bound. We work with our, our participants in, whether inside of the meetings or outside, to actually come up with a specific change of plan for their problematic behavior and see what that looks like on paper and tangible so that they can recognize it as well. Uh, eating healthier and foregoing harmful dietary habits can be treated the same way we treat any other addictive disorder, uh, addictive behavior, excuse me. Uh, start with a change of plan, right? Identify what you want and what you're willing to do to get there and how confident you feel about achieving your goal. Right? We talk about that uh, many times before, and I have mentioned it in this group before. Smart recovery starts with the three questions. What do you want for your future? What are you doing to get there? And most importantly, how do you feel about it? Because we have seen through evidence of, of study, less people are effective in their recovery goals if they do not believe in what they are doing. Uh, there are countless meal plans on the market that you can model your daily diet around to increase your chances of success. I'm someone that's very, very uh, adamant about physical fitness and wellness correlating to my sobriety. And I tell many people who are trying to eat healthier, they'll say, well, food is growing, eat it. Well, you'd be surprised how you of what you used to, healthy moderation that can change the entire flow of the meal plan, right? So there's always options out there. Proper diet does not mean starving yourself. That's another misconception, right? Leading less, I'm going to be healthier. Well, the body needs fuel, right? Make sure that we're aware that not eating less, maybe eating less of certain types of foods might be relevant, but eating less in general does not always lead to healthier gains, right? Especially if you're suffering from an eating disorder. Uh, for example, substituting unhealthy snack options with better choices such as fruits and nuts is a great way to satisfy hunger cravings without completely giving up on your dietary goals. Understand what is in the food you're eating, right? A lot of people don't take the time to do this, right? Oh, I'm eating quinoa and avocado. That's great. Yes, it is. Those are superfoods. They're awesome. But they also do have a very high calorie base, caloric base, right? So if you're not prone to how much you're eating of a healthy thing, a good thing now becomes bad, right? So we make sure that we understand this when we're creating our change of plan. That goes back to that specific model, right? Being very specific about what we're doing, right? Learn about the proper intake of proteins, starches, glucose, or your sugars and carbs that is recommended for someone of your age, gender, and build. Understanding more about what you're putting into your body will help you regulate those types of foods you are eating on a daily basis. We strive to learn about new tools and techniques to combat addictive behavior. Proper eating does not have to be any different. Take time to commit to learning to eat well. You will look and feel better in the long term. And I can personally vouch for the fact that it does directly affect not only my recovery, but my mood and my thinking, right? I think better, I feel better. The energy you guys have come to know and love for me is really a, a testament to making that commitment to change my diet and my living plans, not just addressing my sobriety from alcoholism. Another one that is very common, but very, I don't hear spoken about a lot of is body dysmorphic disorder, okay? Body dysmorphic disorder or BDD. A uh, common addition to many problematic habitual behaviors associated with eating is BDD or body dysmorphic disorder. An article published by the Cleveland Clinic defines BDD as a mental health condition where a person suffering con uh, consuming thoughts about an imagined or very slight defect in their body. The obsession interferes with their work, school, home, and social life. These thoughts become so damaging to a person's everyday life, they may find it hard to interact in public or choose to isolate because of their self-destructive image. This is especially uh, prevalent in instances where a person is suffering from a co-occurring addiction disorder, whereas the habitual practice of said disorder caused drastic changes to the person's physical appearance. Right? The anxiety and depression brought on by the self-loathing tends to exasperate the person's addiction, which in turn further hurts their health. Thus, left untreated can leave the person in a vicious cycle 
of personal gain. I personally um, have dealt with this. I was extremely uncomfortable with who I was and looking at myself in the mirror when I first became sober because of how unhealthy I became. And I was almost, before I realized how to regulate and manage my thought processes and understand and, and diffuse my irrational thinking, all I saw was the negative aspects of my body and I hated looking at myself. Um, this is something that I learned through counseling as well as peer-to-peer -peer, um, uh, sessions that I had to address to if I had if I wanted to reach the recovery goals that I had set for myself because this was a major personal problem. So learning to disarm and accept this was some of the biggest aspects that helped me personally with BDD. Uh, in smart recovery, we often come across this stuck in a mindset of self-loathing negativity, and lack of motivation to change. We address these issues on an individual basis by asking the participant what they actually want, right? Many times we don't listen, right? Many of us in, in the field, we tend to know the answers to these things so quickly, we will say them before we give the participant or a client a chance to articulate what they want. Where are their goals? Where are their desires for their recovery, right? So finding out what they actually want. We try to have the participant be as specific as possible. By using motivational interview techniques, we help the participant begin to reach the core of their problematic thinking by honestly addressing their thoughts, emotions, values, and beliefs. Once clearly established, we can begin to help them learn to dispute the irrational and these concepts to redefine their vision of themselves and their recovery. With BDD, we encourage the participants to acknowledge what they do like about themselves that these things do not have to be physical. Very important for me with BDD was understanding that there were many aspects of myself intangibly that I liked, right? Parts of my personality, my, my empathy for others, my desire to help people, things of that nature, right? Were, were traits that I coveted that I could sometimes not see because I would get so hung up on the physical, right? Once we begin to accept that there are indeed positive things about the self, the participant can believe we can nurture growth of these concepts with the help of other CBD tools, such as creative interests, cognitive reconstruction, and unconditional self-acceptance. Another popular one that may not be spoken about a lot because I don't think there is a real clinical term for this one, but we like to call it the void in addiction and in, in recovery, right? The void. Although not often listed as a co-occurring disorder by medical professionals, many individuals who begin to treat their addictive behaviors by cutting out old habits, contacts, and locations know all too well about this harmful phenomenon. Some recovery programs only focus on eliminating the drug of choice from a person's life, which then leaves a major hole where the addiction used to fill. Without addressing this issue, this void can lead to serious problems like isolation, depression, resentment, frustration, and mood swings. So not necessarily a co-occurring disorder itself, it is definitely a catalyst to leading to co-occurring disorders that, co that correlate with addiction problems. Any one of these is enough for a person new to recovery to turn back to maladaptive behavior as a coping mechanism. Remember, for many of us in recovery, we're used to the old, right? We're used to that pain. We're used to the devil we know. So change is scary for us. And if we don't have a set plan of where to go and this void takes over and encapsulates our thinking, we go to what we know, right? Human beings are habitual creatures. We go to what we know. So it's a very, very dangerous thing for many people in early recovery. Fortunately, Smart Recovery specializes on addressing this within our fourth point of living a balanced lifestyle. So the hierarchy of values, one of the first major defenses towards this. If you are new to Smart Recovery, one of the ways to combat the symptom of the void is to explore your connection to your hierarchy of values, right? The things that are important to us. That's just a fancy way that we put it saying, what are the things worth fighting for in my life? What do I care about most that overrides the desire of my addiction disorder and my maladaptive behavior? For many of us, our time with our addictive or maladaptive behavior may have robbed us of precious time with these important aspects of our lives. Finding new ways to connect to the items within your set of values is a wonderful way to fill the gap left by your, uh, your removal of your addiction. So a lot of us get the opportunity to get back to the people we wanted to be for so long, right? But for some, it takes reminding of that, right? They may be caught in that depressive loop for so long that they don't see the options that are available for them to revisit the person that they want to become. So reminding them of that 
through our sessions, through counseling, through talking, through our peer-to-peer -peer groups is a great way to start practicing that value system. Once again, now that they are learning to be free of their addictive or maladaptive behavior. And then vacuum the hell out of it, right? One of my favorite uh, tools is Vital Absorbing Creative Interest, right? Vital Absorbing Creative Interest or VACI for short can become your new bestie in a road to sobriety. I know it has worked for me. I, it is something I can honestly say besides my unconditional self-acceptance, this is my most useful tool in my recovery arsenal. Any activity can be a VACI, by the way. You do not have to be a gym rat. Right. I, I try to stress that to people all the time. There are so many different variations of being healthy and breaking that societal stereotype of having to spend long hours in the gym, starving yourself by eating crackers and carrots and water to look like, you know, whatever you think is beautiful or been told what is beautiful. Right. Is not the only method of becoming healthy and enjoying your life. There are many different skills and trades out there that can be that people find to be healthy, that can also strengthen your health and your mindset and your spirituality, right? Healthy habits or social events can become a vacuum. All that is required is your interest and a desire to do it. So stressing this to clients and, and our patients that we work with is very important because many of us in recovery, we don't know. We don't know what to do once that addiction is taken away from us because we gave so much time to it that it encompassed so much of our lives. Now that it's gone, it's a scary thing, but we can begin to fill it with progression and things that make recovery desirable, not just work. Uh, remember that Vaki is your self-care, right? We teach our people it's about you. You making that choice also makes it very important. These are activities that bring your relaxation, commitment, and joy, right? These are activities that can fulfill ambitions and challenges your limitations. It is not harmful to if, if it is not harmful to you or others, there is virtually no wrong answer for a vacuum. And there is no limit to how many you can have. So go out there and get a light, right? So the bottom line, uh, treating dual diagnosis is key to true recovery because addiction, in its essence, can have nothing to do with addiction, right? Addiction, in many cases, has to do with trauma, anxiety, depression, and biochemical imbalances. And the person's attempt to regulate and relieve those, um, relieve their own levels of pain through self-medication, right? Treating dual diagnosis identifies ways of addressing these additional or core issues so that the individual can have full and lasting recovery. If you are suffering from one or more of these symptoms or others, it may be wise to stop ignoring them. A lot of us tend to put too much focus in our recovery on the actual substance without recognizing the entire package of everything that needs to be fixed. Taking out the drinking was not enough for me because I was a miserable person without my alcohol because I wasn't addressing my depression. I wasn't addressing my anxiety. I wasn't oppressing my guilt my body dysmorphia, right? My eating disorders. I had so many co-occurring things going on that I did not even recognize because I did not dive deep enough and I didn't have the skill upon me from people talking to me to get me involved in that. So it's very important we start having these conversations with our people in recovery, right? Because your recovery is worth it because you are worth it and right? keep fighting. So that's our bottom line and that's what I have for my uh, presentation for this. So just a just recap to keep in mind that if you are new or not, haven't heard of Smart Recovery before, many of us who come to this program don't have a lot of knowledge about the process and the history and the, the medical aspects of addiction, right? We just know we have a problem. So when asked about that, we can be very specific, right? Well, what's wrong? Well, I drink too much, right? But along with that may come with a myriad of different problems causing the drinking, right? So getting to the core of the why, the addiction uh, exists in the first place for many people in recovery leads to these co-occurring disorders and their, their exposure, right? Which helps us to treat those uh, individuals and let them actually reach full recovery pathways and their recovery goals. And with that, that's what I have. So I'll give the floor back to Nicole. If anyone has any questions, as always, I'm here and I'll put my email in the chat for anyone who doesn't already have it. Uh, I can be reached anytime, even though I'm not in Ohio anymore. I'm still the acting um, director for there for outreach. So I'm still your guy. So please don't think I've abandoned you, Ohio. Love you. Don't worry about it. And uh, I'll open the floor with that. 